Well, great. Uh, let's get started. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Kevin Shaw, and I am the president of the Buckley Program. Also online is our engagement director, Clay Skaggs, who will be moderating this event alongside me. I'm excited to welcome all of you to our firing line debate on nuclear strategy. As the Department of Defense compiles its fifth nuclear posture review, security experts around the globe are asking the question, what role should nuclear weapons play in the United States defense strategy? In 2010, the nuclear posture review called for a reduction in nuclear armaments. But the more recent 2018 review emphasized the role of nuclear capabilities and US security strategy and called for the modernization of our existing nuclear forces. As American adversaries across the globe increasingly threaten the existing world order, we are fortunate to have two guests with us today who have thought extensively about these issues and the role of nuclear weapons in American defense. But before I introduce them, I'd like to say a few words about the Buckley Program. The William F. Buckley Jr. Program is an organization dedicated to promoting, excuse me, promoting intellectual diversity and open political discussion at Yale. We host lectures, dinner seminars, firing line debates, and an annual conference. Our over 350 Buckley Fellows have a wide range of political beliefs, but they all stand united against the formation of a liberal-only echo chamber on campus. By providing Yale students with a forum to engage meaningfully with serious conservative thought, the Buckley program forwards its mission of a more open and more representative political atmosphere on campus. Especially at a university where the mission is the cultivation and creation of new knowledge, Buckley Fellows believe that all perspectives, including those of the right, must be heard and examined in good faith. You can learn more about the program and how to become a fellow on our website, buckleyprogram.com. Now I'll let Clay introduce our guests. Matthew Kronig is a professor in the Department of Government in the Edmund A. Walsh School of Foreign Service at Georgetown University. A 2019 study in Perspectives on Politics ranked him as one of the top 25 most cited political scientists of his generation. Dr. Kronig has served in several positions in the U.S. Department of Defense and the intelligence community in the Bush, Obama, and Trump administrations, including in the Strategy, Middle East, and Nuclear and Missile Defense offices in the Office of the Secretary of Defense and the CIA Strategic Assessments Group. From 2017 to 2021, he was a special government employee and a senior policy advisor to the Office of the Assistant Secretary of Defense for Strategy, Plans, and Capability. Jeffrey Lewis is the director of the East Asia Nonproliferation Program at the Middlebury Institute of International Studies. Before coming to Middlebury, he was the director of the Nuclear Strategy and Nonproliferation Initiative at the New America Foundation. Prior to that, he was executive director of the Managing the Atom Project, executive director of the Association of Professional Schools of International Affairs, a visiting fellow at the Center of Strategic and International Studies, and a desk officer in the Office of the Undersecretary of Defense for Policy. At the Middlebury Institute, he teaches courses on arms control issues uh, in Northeast Asia and Chinese nuclear policy. Professor Lewis also hosts Arms Control Wonk, a highly renowned and very entertaining podcast on arms control. Regarding the format of today's debate, I'll have each of our guests start with five minute opening statements, after which we'll then give both speakers two minutes to respond. I'll then move into our questions and questions from you, the audience, which you can submit throughout the event using the Q&A feature on the lower panel of the Zoom window. Finally, we will conclude with brief closing remarks from both speakers. The event should conclude at 5.30 p.m. With that, please join me in welcoming Professor Matthew Kronig and Professor Jeffrey Lewis virtually to Yale and to the Buckley program. Professor Kronig, I'd like to invite you to begin. Great, well, thank you very much for that introduction, Clay. It's really a pleasure. Uh, to be here at the Buckley program at Yale. Uh, pleasure to be speaking uh, alongside Dr. Lewis and uh, good to see many of our um, colleagues and, and others uh, uh, watching tonight's event. Um, so um, I'm, I'm going to argue that US nuclear weapons have been uh, one of the major forces for good in the world over the past 75 years uh, and that they're uh, really a central pillar of this US led rules based international system that's provided un unprecedented levels of peace, prosperity, and freedom uh, globally over the past uh, 75 years. So, so to do that in five minutes, I just wanna make uh, three points. Uh, first, the threats uh, to this US-led international uh, system and uh, the nuclear dimension of those threats are growing. Uh, so Russia is threatening a major, major invasion of Ukraine, uh, as we know, uh, has invaded its neighbors, made threats against NATO and the United States and is greatly expanding uh, its nuclear capabilities, including um, exotic and non-strategic nuclear weapons not covered in the New START Treaty. Uh, 
Uh, China is, is engaging in a massive nuclear buildup. The Pentagon predicts that it could almost quintuple uh, the size of its arsenal to near uh, 1,000 uh, nuclear weapons. China is also making threats against Taiwan and its uh, neighbors. Uh, and this means that for the first time, uh, the United States faces an unprecedented situation dealing with two nuclear armed uh, peer uh, or near peer superpowers, uh, Russia and China, both as near peer nuclear superpowers. Uh, North Korea's nuclear arsenal is growing. It's become only the third U.S. adversary that can threaten nuclear war against the U.S. homeland. And uh, experts estimate that Iran could dash to a uh, nuclear weapons breakout in about uh, three weeks. Uh, so there are serious nuclear threats again, uh, you know, probably the most serious nuclear threats we've faced since um, the Cold War and maybe even some of the more dangerous periods of the Cold War. Uh, so what is the nuclear strategy and posture that the United States needs to deal with this? And this kind of gets to my second major point, I, I would argue that U.S. nuclear weapons are special uh, and uh, doesn't make sense to analyze kind of nuclear strategy in general or, or other uh, countries' nuclear strategies uh, because the United States uh, does extraordinary things with its nuclear weapons. It, it protects the entire free world. Uh, the United States extends its nuclear weapons to over 30 formal treaty allies, uh, the 30 other members of NATO, uh, Japan, South Korea, Australia, arguably other countries depend on U.S. nuclear weapons for their security. Uh, and, and the United States extends deterrence, not just out of the goodness of its heart, but because it's in uh, our own interest. We want to maintain stability in those important and wealthy geopolitical regions. Uh, it's also part of our non-proliferation strategy. We essentially make a deal with these countries. Uh, don't build your own nuclear weapons. Uh, you can rely on U.S. nuclear weapons for your security. And it's, it's very likely with, that without those extended deterrence guarantees, uh, that many U.S. allies, Japan, South Korea, Taiwan, Germany, others would have nuclear weapons uh, today. Uh, so U.S. nuclear weapons have really been a central pillar of the rules-based uh, system, preventing the spread of nuclear weapons, uh, maintaining peace and stability in Europe and Asia in particular. And I think it's no coincidence that these are uh, have become gardens of, um, of peace, uh, prosperity, and, and freedom because they have had the security underwritten by American nuclear weapons. So, so given the special role of U.S. nuclear weapons, what kind of uh, capabilities, what kind of nuclear posture does the United States need? This is my third and final point. I, I think President Kennedy was right when he said the United States needs a nuclear arsenal, quote, second to none. Um, the United States demands more of its nuclear weapons than any other country, and so it needs a, a robust nuclear force. Uh, fortunately, there is a bipartisan consensus in favor of nuclear modernization, started by Obama, continued by Trump, uh, I suspect it will be continued by Biden. Uh, but given the, the growing threats, I do think there's a need to think about, does the United States need to strengthen uh, its nuclear uh, capabilities in, very way, in various ways? Uh, and then, you know, final thing that's special about U.S. nuclear weapons is we can afford it. Uh, we've been blessed with having the largest, most innovative economy um, over the past 75 years. And so the uh, United States only spends about 5% of its defense budget on nuclear weapons. And so for the most important uh, mission of the Department of Defense, this seems like a, a good value to me. Um, so with, with any luck and, and uh, uh, by modernizing its arsenal, maintaining this robust uh, deterrent, extending deterrence to the entire free world, I think that uh, the world can again experience another uh, 75 years of increasing peace, prosperity and freedom. So I'll end my opening remarks there and look forward to the discussion. Shall I just begin? Yes, please, Dr. Lewis. Okay. Uh, well, I think that's a, a, a loving tribute to nuclear weapons. It's a shame that they don't have feelings. Uh, I think they'd be moved uh, to hear such lovely words about, about the role they play. I think that if we're going to have a debate though, we probably should try to put on the table some of the places where we might disagree or some of the choices that the United States may be facing. Um, I actually agree with Matt that the United States is entering this era where we have these two competitors who have large and growing nuclear arsenals um, that pose real fundamental questions for what our own nuclear arsenal should do. But if we want to try to frame that and ask questions about what our response should be to the various changes that the Russians and the Chinese are making in their nuclear arsenals, I think we have to talk a little bit about deterrence. Uh, 
what we think deterrence is, how it functions, uh, and whether we're really fundamentally comfortable with it. Uh, because I think one of the interesting things is that we have this sort of bipartisan consensus in Washington to talk about uh, how wonderful deterrence is. Um, but in fact, a significant number of, uh, of people on the left and people on the right have long expressed discomfort with the idea of relying on nuclear deterrence. Uh, obviously, given political differences, people draw different conclusions about what to do about that. Um, but I want to spend a, a minute or two unpacking the idea of nuclear deterrence. Uh, in order to sort of tee up this question of what we ought to be doing. You know, nuclear deterrence is an extremely unusual relationship uh, because often when we talk about nuclear weapons, we imagine we're talking about being in a position of strength, right? We seek more nuclear weapons because we want to be stronger. But nuclear deterrence is actually one of the most intimate relations one can have with an adversary. It's extremely uncomfortable, I think, at some level because you are entering into a relationship where each party has the ability to destroy one another. And we're relying heavily on a kind of faith or belief uh, that the leader of Russia or the leader of China is going to be someone who's going to be rational, someone who's going to uh, be trustworthy with nuclear weapons, someone who's going to understand what we're trying to communicate. Uh, and it's actually an extraordinary amount of trust to place in an adversary to enter a nuclear deterrent relationship. I actually think most of us, if we really think about it, are probably pretty uncomfortable with the idea of nuclear deterrence. Each year, the US Strategic Command releases a chart, uh, and that chart shows a number of people who were, have been killed in great power wars uh, over the years. And they show large numbers of people being killed until the end of World War II, the advent of nuclear weapons, and those numbers drop. Uh, and STRATCOM says that this is a sign that nuclear deterrence works very well. The problem is if you really believe that, if you really truly believe that, then one would be delighted that China was building up its nuclear arsenal. One would be delighted that North Korea had nuclear weapons. One would be delighted that Iran is on the verge of building a nuclear weapon because we would be openly embracing this idea of deterrence leading to stability. But we don't think that, of course, right? So I think at a fundamental level, when we see nuclear weapons elsewhere in the world, we are not really fundamentally talking about deterrence, we're talking about danger. And then the question is, how do we respond to that danger? Now, I'm someone who thinks that when we look at nuclear weapons, the fundamental lesson of the nuclear age is that nuclear weapons, because they create this intimate relationship, they do this thing that we, we don't like and don't want and would like to avoid if we could, which is they actually create a shared interest with our worst enemies in the world. Uh, we hated the Soviet Union during the Cold War and with good reason. It was a terrible, terrible regime. And yet what nuclear weapons did was they brought us together and forced us to collaborate because we had a shared interest in survival, even though we didn't like one another very much. So this is a very peculiar moment in history because on the one hand, we do see ourselves in competition with Russia and China, but the choice we're making is to enter this very intimate and strange relationship. So in my last 30 seconds, I'll just put on the table, what are our choices? Well, one choice is to try to eliminate nuclear weapons. I don't think that's very likely to happen. So that leaves us with two other choices. We can either settle for deterrence, in which case we're not using nuclear weapons for a wide variety of things, but really only to deter a nuclear attack by China and Russia. Or we can try to invest large sums of money to build our way out of a deterrent relationship, to somehow escape from that. Uh, I tend to think deterrence is better. I suspect Matt would prefer to build our way out. Um, and I'm curious to hear if he agrees with that. Mr. Uh, Greenagg, I'd like to invite you to give two minutes of uh, rebuttal. Okay, great. Well, well, I do think that deterrence um, is the only um, solution. Um, uh, you know, I think that we are vulnerable to Russian and Chinese nuclear weapons. We might prefer uh, that we're not, but we are, so we have to deter um, those attacks. And, and that's why it's important uh, that the United States has a, uh, a credible uh, deterrent and a robust nuclear arsenal. Uh, you know, the alternative... Uh, Dr. Lewis spent a lot of time criticizing uh, or, or questioning deterrence, and my question back was going to be, what is what is the alternative? Uh, because you know maybe eliminating nuclear weapons would be a nice alternative in, in theory, but I don't think it's possible. So I think as long as nuclear weapons are here, we we do have to have uh, an effective deterrent. Um, on this um, idea that um, you know we don't really believe that nuclear weapons cause stability because we get nervous when Russia, China, and Iran have them. 
I, I would say that uh, it's not actually a paradox. It, it depends on who possesses the technology. Uh, you know, arsonists and bakers both use fire, but but for very different reasons. And so I think the United States and its allies uh, have used nuclear weapons to build and, and defend this rules-based international system that I think has been good for the world and good for Americans. Uh, and Russia, China, Iran, and North Korea, these revisionist autocracies have very different goals. Uh, they're trying to uh, revise the system, tear it down, make the world safe for autocracy. And they're using their nuclear weapons uh, for that uh, purpose, to backstop uh, their aggression. Uh, and so it's, I think, quite simple. U.S. nuclear weapons are, are good. Uh, Russian, Chinese, North Korean nuclear weapons uh, are bad. And it's all about the, the countries that possess them and what it is that they're trying to achieve uh, in the world. So uh, all uh, in my rebuttal there. There's a couple of questions being thrown around. So I think you guys are making our jobs too easy. Uh, Dr. Lewis, you have two minutes to respond. Well, just very briefly, what I'm what I'm trying to cue up is this question of what do we want to do with our nuclear arsenal? I, I actually agree we're not going to be eliminating nuclear weapons anytime soon. Um, I, I'm rather sympathetic to Ronald Reagan's deep distrust of nuclear deterrence. Uh, I'm someone who thinks that uh, while there are many short-term benefits to building our security on nuclear deterrence, we are counting on Russia and China being rational and trustworthy forever. Uh, and always making good decisions. Uh, and I'm not somebody who's very comfortable doing that forever. But I accept that we live in this world where deterrence is going to be, nuclear weapons at least are going to be part of the equation. And so I, again, I would, I would emphasize, we have this choice in front of us. Do we look at Russia and China and do we say, we want a basic deterrent against them? We want to be able to ensure that they cannot launch a nuclear attack against us. In which case the requirements for deterrence are relatively small. Uh, and we can take the money that we might have spent on many nuclear systems and we could spend it on conventional defenses for Taiwan or the Baltics, just to make sure that we have enough to deter a nuclear attack. Or we can try to escape from deterrence. We can try to build our way out. We can try to build to nuclear superiority with much greater numbers. We can try to build leak-proof defenses. And that's a case where basically we very unlikely, I think, be able to afford all the conventional things we wanna do. Um, but we would have to have some idea that we could have those investments pay off, right? That our ability to build would be sufficient that uh, even though China has an economy that is now nearly as large as ours, we could outspend them and the Russians simultaneously. If you don't think that latter thing is possible, right? If you think you are stuck in the situation where you are merely trying to deter the Russians and the Chinese, I think as we look at our policy choices uh, in the coming years, what I think we're going to find is that while a basic minimum deterrent is an important requirement, um, we are very likely, I think, to want to spend that money on conventional capabilities instead. Before we ask our first question of tonight, I'd like to invite all audience members to submit questions via the bottom right of their Zoom window. Um, but perhaps to get us started, uh, Professor Grunig, what, what does your timeline for the next 10 years look like in terms of strengthening our forces? I know that the 2022 nuclear posture review is just about to come out. What would you like to see in it? Yeah, thanks, Kevin. Well, as I said, there is, I, I think, this bipartisan consensus. Our, our nuclear weapons are getting old. They were built in the 70s and 80s. Uh, don't know if you drive a car, but if, if so, it probably wasn't built in the 70s and 80s. So as long as we want nuclear weapons, we, we need to modernize them, make sure they work. Uh, so these plans were started with Obama, and uh, the plan is to build new uh, nuclear submarines, new bombers, uh, new intercontinental ballistic missiles, so to modernize uh, the triad. Um, and then the Trump administration introduced uh, in the 2018 Nuclear Posture Review two um, so-called supplemental low-yield capabilities uh, to de deter the Russia uh, escalate to de-escalate uh, threat. And, and I do think that these are important capabilities uh, for Russia, but also for China and for assuring allies. So I hope that the Biden administration continues with those, although there is some rumors that they might kill um, at least one of those uh, systems. Um, so I, I guess I'm basically looking for um, continuity. Uh, I think that um, uh, the uh, nuclear strategy and, and posture we've had has, has been working and, and now is certainly not the time to cut capabilities or weaken our declaratory policy or posture. Uh, and, and again, maybe time to think about some marginal uh, enhancements given the growing threat uh, from our rivals. Thank you, Professor Koenig. And Dr. Lewis, what would you like to see in the 22 Nuclear Posture Review? Uh, 
I'd like to see the authors of the Nuclear Posture Review really try to reckon with what it would mean to align our nuclear forces with the role that they can plausibly play. I think one area I disagree with Matt uh, in is I don't think our nuclear forces have been working. Uh, you know, I, I remember when the Bush administration made the argument that if we maintained our nuclear forces at, at a factor of four larger than China's, uh, that China would be dissuaded from attempting uh, a large buildup in which it began to erode and then eventually catch up to, in terms of numbers, the United States. I, I think we're on that path at this point. Um, we kept a factor of four bigger than they did, and they simply are now in the process of building up. Uh, and in fact, they're doing so in a situation where they have uh, an economy that is sufficiently large that it's you know not clear to me we will necessarily be able to keep pace with both China and Russia in a in in the traditional way we've been doing. So what I what I think I would like to see is for U.S. policymakers to look at nuclear weapons and ask, well, what can they plausibly do? Um, Fundamentally, I think they can deter an attack on the United States and our allies using nuclear weapons, uh, but I don't think they can do much more than that. Uh, and so often when we, I think we look, especially at high ticket items, like say the new land-based uh, ICBM, which will cost $100 billion to buy uh, and about $300 billion to operate over the course of its lifetime. I'd really like to see people wrestle with the question, you know, would we rather have a 400 ship Navy instead of a 300 ship Navy, right? Are there ways in which we could take some of these capabilities, which I believe don't add that much deterrence, and spend that on, again, mounting credible conventional defenses of our allies, particularly the Baltics and Taiwan. I wanted to follow up with one of those points with Professor Koenig. Professor Koenig, you've argued that having uh, a robust nuclear arsenal that is much more advanced than the enemies gives you leverage in bargaining uh, during crises. Can you explain your thoughts on that and why you think it's important to have a supreme uh, supremacy? Yes, well, um, and this um, also gets to something that uh, Dr. Lewis said. He says we have this choice between kind of having a basic deterrent or um, spending our way uh, out of deterrence. And, and I don't see that as, as the choice. And I, I think often uh, pe people misunderstand um, U.S. nuclear strategy. Um, so one thing that's important to understand is that the United States doesn't have a, a so-called counter value targeting strategy. It has a counter force targeting strategy, and it does that for legal and moral um, reasons. And President Obama was very clear about this. So uh, sorry, terminology, you know, counter value basically use nuclear weapons to bomb cities and slaughter large numbers of innocent people, uh, counter force to try to target the enemy's nuclear forces. Uh, so the United States has a counterforce strategy, and as Obama said, this is in part for moral reasons. Uh, law of armed conflict requires you to distinguish between civilian and military targets. Uh, but we also do it for strategic reasons, because God forbid if uh, uh, nuclear deterrence fails and, and there's a nuclear attack, uh, you know, none of us are going to want the U.S. president to say, OK, now it's time to sit back uh, and accept our mutually assured destruction. We're going to want uh, the president to do everything he can to try to limit damage to the United States and to its allies. So with counterforce targeting, we can destroy enemies nuclear weapons before they can be used against us. Uh, and so a counterforce strategy requires a larger arsenal. If, if we just wanted to threaten to slaughter a bunch of people in, in uh, Russia and, uh, and China, you know, maybe two nuclear weapons would be enough, maybe four would be enough. Uh, but for counterforce uh, targeting, you need to count up the uh, relevant strategic targets in Russia, China, North Korea, uh, and then also, you know, military planners are somewhat cautious. If you're doing something as important as conducting a nuclear strike, you don't want to miss. And so outside analysts often assume that planners assume uh, kind of two offensive warheads for every uh, target. Uh, and so you do that math and the United States you know, needs the 2000 or so nuclear weapons um, that it uh, has um, today. So I think uh, for those reasons, for counterforce targeting, the United States needs this robust force. Uh, but also for extended deterrence, um, you know, uh, we're essentially, because of extended deterrence, promising to play a game of nuclear chicken um, every day uh, on behalf of Estonia against Russia, on behalf of uh, Japan against China, on behalf of South Korea against North Korea. Uh, and uh, in a game of chicken, if you get a choice, uh, would you rather drive a Hummer or, or a Prius? Um, you know, if I had to play games of chicken every day and I, and I had a choice, I would choose to drive uh, the Hummer. And, and so that's what the United States does, not, not that uh, it always wins, but that on average, uh, the adversary is going to swear first. And, and on average, the adversary is gonna say, you know what, I'd, I'd rather not even get in the car and, and take my chances today. Um, so that's why the United States needs uh, this robust force. 
Dr. Lewis, do you agree with Professor Kronig's Hummer Prius analogy? And do you, do you see his dichotomy between counter value, counter force um, as a true one? Or would you disagree with his calculus there? Uh, I don't do car analogies. Uh, they're tendentious. I mean, we can always pretend something's a Hummer or a Prius or a, a Yugo or God knows what. Uh, I think it's it's better to try to be more more specific. I, the counterforce point, I think, is, is a very important one. The Kennedy administration did initially embrace this idea of damage limitation, which is that if a nuclear war breaks out, you want to have enough capability to really limit the damage the Soviet Union would be able to inflict on the United States. The problem is the Kennedy administration decided that even the Soviet Union in the 1960s was it was too difficult to do damage limitation against. They had enough money and scientific and technical expertise that they could build their way back to a kind of parity with the United States, even though we had uh, a small numerical advantage. Uh, and so ultimately the Kennedy administration settled for something called assured destruction, which is the kind of basic deterrent strategy that, that I'm outlining. Now, conservatives were quite critical of this for many of the reasons I outlined earlier. And, and honestly, there, there's, there's some real argument here. What they said is that if you're accepting a basic deterrent, it's not really assured deterrence. They called it mutual assured deterrence, which was, by the way, a, a, a negative thing, right? When conservatives said that, they were not being nice to President Kennedy. They also called it assured vulnerability. And so ultimately, we had this fundamental debate of, do you accept a kind of mutual deterrent relationship, in which case your requirements are much, much lower, or do you try to build your way out? Now, with the Soviet Union, as its economy faltered, it was possible for us to look at building our way out. I would argue that today that is not a viable strategy because we aren't just trying to build out, build out of a vulnerability with Russia, which would be hard enough as it is. We have to simultaneously do it with China. So we're entering an era where we have two near peer competitors, one of which has an economy that will be as large as ours. It is just not going to be, I think, fundamentally tenable to try to build our way to anything that looks like superiority, what will be permanently locked in is parity. And so I think it is fundamentally in our interest to spend as little as we have to on this hopeless game of nuclear parity and as much as we possibly can on mounting credible conventional defenses of our allies. So Dr. Oh, you Lewis, want a 400 ship Navy? It would be great. So Dr. Lewis, if I'm getting your argument correctly, you're sort of arguing that it's not possible for us to achieve nuclear supremacy in this competition with Russia and China. They have too many resources, too much economic might for us to dominate them completely in the way that Professor Kronig is describing. Yes, I don't see any plausible route forward. Um, you know, China has built 300 missile silos. We are now looking at a program to build 400 replacement ICBMs. Actually, I think technically the requirement is 450. That's going to cost us $100 billion to do that, $300 billion to operate them over the lifetime. If you want to go to something like superiority with two adversaries, and keep in mind, if you're going to have a nuclear war with one, you need to retain an entire capability on the other hand. You know, we are talking about trillions and trillions and trillions of dollars. And ultimately, I don't think there's much squeeze or juice in that lemon that fundamentally, I want to be able to deter a nuclear attack on the United States and our allies. And that requires a basic minimum deterrent. Um, but after that, I would much rather have the capacity to defeat the Russians and the Baltics and to defeat the Chinese in Taiwan while relying on nuclear weapons as a backstop. Professor Gronick, I wanted to give you a chance to respond. As Clay mentioned, I know you're one of the largest proponents of nuclear supremacy. Do you agree with Dr. Lewis's framing of this issue? Do you think we can compete in this area? Yeah, I, I disagree. And so he's come to the cost issue uh, many times. I, I think, um, you know, he says we can't afford nuclear uh, deterrence. I, I'd say we can't afford not to have um, nuclear deterrence. Um, so in, in terms of um, competition with Russia and China, the United States uh, is 23% of global GDP currently. Uh, Russia and China together are 18%. So even if it's us against both of them at the same time, we, we can afford to outspend them. Uh, but fortunately, it's not just um, us if we're talking about conventional as well, uh, because we have um, allies uh, and uh, U.S. and formal treaty allies are 60 percent of global GDP. Uh, so together, we, ha we have more than enough resources to maintain effective conventional and 
nuclear deterrence against uh, Russia and China. We, we don't have to, we're not France, we don't have to make tough uh, resource uh, choices. We can uh, afford to deal with Russia and China, have an effective conventional force and an effective nuclear force. Uh, Jeffrey Lewis has also said we'd, uh, we essentially, we should go to a no first use policy that our, nu or, um, our sole purpose policy that our nuclear weapons should only be to deter nuclear attack. That's what he'd want. Uh, he'd want conventional for Estonia and Taiwan. Uh, the only problem is Estonia and Taiwan uh, disagree with him. Uh, they very much want uh, the U.S. nuclear uh, umbrella to deter conventional attack as well. Uh, they're, they're worried about a Russian conventional attack, rightly so, given what Russia is doing uh, as we speak. Uh, Taiwan's worried about a, a Chinese attack. Um, so leaving the nuclear option on the table to deter conventional attack uh, has always been um, U.S. nuclear strategy going. Um, uh, you know, we, we've never uh, had a no first use policy. And so it, it makes sense to maintain that. It doesn't make essentially going to a no first use or sole purpose policy would be making a promise to Putin and a promise to Xi, um, essentially saying, uh, you know, you can attack our allies with conventional weapons. You can use chem, bio, do whatever you want. Uh, and we're not going to use our nuclear weapons. Don't worry about that. Uh, I don't see the reason to assure dangerous adversaries of that. I think we do need to keep the nuclear uh, arsenal on, on the table to deter conventional attack. And, and again, I think we and our allies can afford an effective conventional uh, and nuclear uh, force. So it's, it seems that one development that is challenging both the idea of supremacy and parity is the rise of asymmetric capabilities like low yield nuclear, nuclear weapons, um, anti-ballistic missile uh, systems, and space and cyber operations. Professor Kronig, how do you think that uh, these asymmetric capabilities change nuclear calculus, and do you think they make uh, the world less stable? What well, is one of the big um, questions right now that uh, you know we're all trying to wrestle with? Because in, in the 1970s, you talked about strategic forces. You're basically talking about nuclear weapons. Now you talk about strategic forces, it's, it's uh, you know, strategic nuclear weapons, non-strategic nuclear weapons, uh, hypersonic missiles, directed energy, lasers, uh, cyber space. Uh, and so I think it is becoming um, you know, more complicated and, and we need uh, hard thinking about this. Um, there have been um, scholars uh, recently who've argued that this makes things less stable uh, in general. And, and I've written a little bit um, criticizing that because again, I think the technology in and of itself isn't stabilizing or destabilizing. Uh, it matters the countries that possess it and what they're trying to do with it. And so I think if um, the United States and its allies uh, can harness new technology uh, into our militaries, into our strategic forces to maintain uh, our traditional quantitative and qualitative advantages. Um, and, and I think that the peace we've had over the past 25 years has been because of, of US superiority. Uh, conventional uh, and, and nuclear that's deterred um, uh, uh, rivals. And so I think we, we want to maintain these quantitative and qualitative advantages. Uh, and if we allow Russia, China, North Korea, other revisionist autocracies to gain the advantage in these new technologies, I think that's what would be uh, really destabilizing. And Dr. Lewis, uh, the 2018 Nuclear Posture Review seemed to uh, try to bolster the U.S. to match its adversaries in these asymmetric capabilities. How do you feel about this? Do you think this is destabilizing? Well, I mean, let me start by saying, you know you're winning a debate when your opponent starts arguing with things you didn't say. Um, I actually don't support a no first use policy. And I didn't say we couldn't afford nuclear deterrence. What I said was we couldn't afford nuclear superiority. And this gets to the point about the, I think the dissatisfaction I have with the 2018 nuclear posture review, which is to say that if we are looking at a situation where we want deterrence, we can achieve that relatively inexpensively. We can achieve that with a relatively small force because it's hard to imagine China or Russia acquiring the kind of capability that would allow them to conduct a disarming first strike against us and not suffer a terrible, terrible retaliation. What becomes extremely expensive, what I don't think they can achieve, and most importantly, what I don't think we can achieve is what you would call a splendid first strike capability. I just don't think it's very feasible to imagine that we can spend so much money and spend so much more money than both the Russians and the Chinese that we could render their deterrence useless in a first strike. Uh, and so, you know, just to give a simple example, we, we're seeing this kind of reaction cycle already where we've built a missile defense system in Alaska at great expense. It has about 40 interceptors, which is good for about 10 ICBMs. 
All right, so it's an extremely limited capability. And we've already seen both China and Russia are developing very long range hypersonic gliders, at least in part uh, with the idea that they could defeat that. And we've seen the United States now investing in a new generation of space-based systems to be able to detect and track those gliders. And we've seen China and Russia test anti-satellite weapons in order to shoot down those satellites. So when you are dealing with such a complicated series of capabilities, the idea that you are somehow going to be able to spend so much more money than your opponents and spend it in such an efficient way and develop such exquisite capabilities that you can somehow prevail over them really seems to me to be very unrealistic. And so we really are stuck, I think, fundamentally with this mutual deterrence relationship, which I admit is extremely undesirable, but better than the alternatives of spending our way on an arms race to nowhere or attempting to eliminate these weapons, which I don't think is possible. I wanted to move over to some audience questions since I, I know we're running a little bit low on time now. Um, this is one is for you, Professor Kronig, uh, and I kind of wanted to ask you it most directly. Uh, do you see deterrence and non-proliferation goals as incompatible? Uh, no, I see them as, as reinforcing. And I think one of the um, most important, uh, so, so the United States um, wants to deter Russia, China, uh, Iran, North Korea from attacking uh, us and our allies. Uh, and we also want to prevent the spread of these dangerous weapons to other countries, uh, including our own allies. And, and so the United States uh, has always been a leader in nuclear nonproliferation. Uh, and our strong nuclear posture uh, is one of the major pillars of the nuclear nonproliferation regime. Uh, again, we go to Japan, to South Korea, uh, historically to Taiwan and Germany, you know, today to uh, Eastern European countries and say, don't build your own nuclear weapons. You can rely uh, on the U.S. nuclear umbrella. So I think by having uh, this uh, umbrella, the United States uh, is contributing uh, to, uh, to, to, to stopping uh, the spread of nuclear weapons. Uh, in his last comment, uh, Dr. Lewis said that uh, declared himself to be winning the debate. I, I guess I would just say that every uh, U.S. presidential administration uh, disagrees uh, with his views on nuclear deterrence. Uh, the United States, since um, the Carter administration, has always um, uh, uh, made damage limitation a goal of nuclear strategy. It's explicit in the 2018 NPR. Uh, and uh, maintaining a triad uh, is something that um, goes back to um, uh, you know, the early days of the Cold War. Uh, leaving nuclear weapons on the table to deter conventional attack is something that every presidential administration uh, agrees on. So I, I think there is a bipartisan consensus on these issues. And then there are some you know, on, on, uh, the, uh, uh, you know, who, who disagree with this. But um, the, the presidents who've been responsible for protecting the American people, the secretaries of defense who've been responsible for protecting the American people have come to the same conclusions time and time again. Dr. Lewis, we have a audience question for you. Um, is any expansion of nu nuclear arsenal uh, for US allies on the table? Many allies such as Japan or South Korea have indicated interest in developing these weapons with US approval. How would this change nuclear calculus and would it be de destabilizing? I think it depends. It's, it's actually a very complicated question. Um, you know, in some cases, there are definitely countries that if they were to develop nuclear weapons, I think it would be deeply destabilizing. Uh, Saudi Arabia jumps to mind. I think Japan would probably be very destabilizing to its neighbors. Although I wouldn't want to see South Korea develop nuclear weapons, I think countries would have a very different reaction to that. Uh, in general, though, I would say I, I, I don't think fundamentally it's a good idea for the United States to encourage its allies to develop nuclear weapons. Uh, simply because it complicates a lot of the work we'd like to do together. You know, in the past, uh, the U.S. has worked out nuclear sharing arrangements with some allies. And so there are, there are definitely things you can do that can give your alliance a nuclear character, I think, that are short um, of allies, allies proliferating. Um, and by the way, just to say, I mean, in terms of who's winning the debate or not, I, it, it's absolutely true. I'm extremely lucky. I don't have to debate Paul Nitza. George Kennan, Albert Wolstetter. I just have to debate Matt. Well, uh, I hope that this has been a lively debate so far. Um, an audience member asks you, Professor Kroenig, is it realistic to think a no first use uh, that no first use is a possible policy that can deter conventional attack, especially as the United States has been reluctant to lend military personnel support to Ukraine in their own crisis? and faltering responses from European nations, mainly Germany, but also in delinquency of NATO monetary commitments. 
it seems like this is the exact line Putin is towing and we have failed to push back. Yeah, it's a good question. So, so just to be clear on the terminology, so um, the United States does not have a no first use policy. We've said that we would leave the nuclear threat on the table to respond to major conventional attacks, to uh, biological weapons attacks, to other non-nuclear um, strategic attacks. Uh, and that's always been the purpose of uh, U.S. nuclear weapons during the Cold War. Uh, we said we would use nuclear weapons to deter a major conventional Russian conventional invasion of Europe. At the end of the Cold War, we said we'd use our nuclear weapons to deter chem and, and biological attacks from rogue states. Uh, and now it, we say it's our policy to deter conventional attack um, from Russia, China or others against our uh, allies. So Ukraine is, is a little different. Uh, Ukraine is not a formal uh, treaty ally. Uh, and so there was never a U.S. promise to use our nuclear weapons to uh, defend Ukraine. Um, and uh, but I do think that that threat would be credible uh, for a NATO ally, uh, for a formal treaty ally. And I think that's why we see Putin invading Georgia and Ukraine, but not Estonia, uh, not um, Romania. Uh, and, and would it be um, credible? I, I think it depends. You know, the uh, leaving the nuclear option on the table doesn't guarantee that nuclear weapons would be the automatic and, and uh, necessary response. Uh, just that we're not going to take it off the table. It's a possibility. It's something that the adversary needs to worry about. We're not going to assure the adversary that that he doesn't need to worry about it. Great. I have a question for both of you. So the 2018 Nuclear Posture Review called for modernization in all three legs of the nuclear triad. Uh, I'm wondering, do you think that all three, that uh, nuclear sub, uh, submarines, uh, bombers and ICBMs, are they all necessary? Some have argued we could get, we could only have submarines uh, for lower cost, um, while some argue that it's very necessary. Dr. Lewis, would you like to start? Yeah, I would rank order them. We absolutely need the submarines. And I'm, I'm a little nervous because, um, because we're trying to do a one-for-one -one replacement across, across the board. There's been this little sleight of hand that's happened where we're not gonna replace them on time. And so the submarine fleet is gonna drop to 10 boats and they kind of pinky promise that they'll build two more boats at the other end. And I don't believe that's ever gonna happen. So I'm, I'm extremely alarmed that we're gonna bring the number of submarines down. And that's not something I, I would want to see. So I would place the submarines at the top of the list. They're the most survivable capability. Uh, and there's, they're, they're really great. The B-21, the new bomber, we're gonna buy that for conventional reasons. Uh, and so, you know, giving that uh, nuclear capability is a relatively small additional cost. It simply requires uh, probably a new cruise missile. You can develop that. The Defense Department is developing that on the basis of an existing cruise missile. That strikes me as a really affordable capability. What that leaves us with is this $300 billion we're going to have to spend on the new ICBM. And so there are arguments for having ICBMs. They're actually, I think they're pretty serious arguments. Um, I do think a lot of the other capabilities solve that, uh, but my goal would be to get the cost of a replacement ICBM as low as possible. Uh, and so, you know, there are options like life extending the current force. Um, you know, you could put submarine launch ballistic missiles in silos, but my fundamental concern is I don't want to spend a giant money, a giant amount of money right now on ICBMs when there are, I think, real long-term concerns about whether ICBMs sitting in silos will be vulnerable. Uh, we may ultimately end up deciding that we want some other kind of land-based architecture. And I just, I'm, I'm extremely uncomfortable committing $300 billion to an architecture that I have real long-term doubts about. And pr Professor Koenig, what do you think about the nuclear triad? Yes, I think we need the nuclear triad. And uh, you're right that some people have said, maybe we don't. Um, you know, there are also people who say maybe, you know, COVID vaccines uh, don't work or are dangerous. Um, but if you look at, um, again, every presidential administration, uh, going back to the early days of the Cold War, they've all uh, decided we, we do need all three legs of the triad. Um, Secretary of Defense Mattis, um, uh, Trump's first Secretary of Defense, uh, he was a Marine. Uh, the Marines don't have nuclear weapons. So he hadn't thought a lot about nuclear strategy during his uh, testimony. Uh, he said, yeah, maybe we don't need ICBMs. I'm going to take a hard look at that. Uh, and then came out with his nuclear posture review. And he, he said, yeah, I've looked at this hard. Uh, there, there's no way that I can do what I need to do in terms of nuclear deterrence uh, without um, ICBMs. So, so we do need all three legs. Um, Dr. Lewis mentions the high price, but um, again, the entire modernization program is about 5% of the defense budget. 
Um, uh, Mattis and others have said uh, nuclear deterrence is the most important mission of the Department of Defense. So is, is 5% too much for the most important mission? You know, may, maybe, um, you know, reasonable people can disagree, but to me, it seems like a good value. And, and it's interesting he's making uh, cost arguments about the ICBM because it's actually the cheapest leg of the triad. You know, sticking a missile in a hole uh, is a lot uh, cheaper than operating submarines, operating um, strategic bombers. Uh, and so if uh, cost savings is really a, a primary goal here, which I don't think it should be, then we'd be looking at other capabilities, not the ICBMs. Uh, on the idea of life extending, you know, basically just keeping our 1970s and 80s era missiles uh, around, um, uh, the Air Force and others have looked at this and they've said at this point it would actually be um, uh, more expensive to uh, try to keep these things going than it would be to just build um, new. And I've been out to some of the missile um, uh, bases and it's uh, remarkable. There are almost more mechanics uh, there than uh, missileers because it's so much work to keep these old systems going. Uh, like with an old car, or I, I do car metaphors, you know, at, at a certain point with an old car, it becomes more expensive to try to keep repairing it than it does to just go go get a new one. Uh, another audience member earlier in this debate asked, um, we have traditionally looked at U.S.-Russia nuclear relations and U.S.-China nuclear relations as separate bilaterals. Is it time to think of U.S.-Russia-China nuclear relations as a trilateral? What does that mean for deterrence and arms control? Dr. Lewis, if you'd like to take a shot at this first. Yeah, I don't actually think it makes a lot of sense to think of it as a uh, trilateral. I mean, the nature of our relations are different. The nature of your deterrent relations are different. The type of forces we have are different. I mean, I, there was a real effort in the Trump administration to argue that China should come into the arms control arrangement that we have with the Russians. Um, and the problem is that arms control arrangement with the Russians, the counting rules we had, would have counted the Chinese as having no nuclear weapons. So a lot of the work that we've done in the bilateral relationship with, with the Russians is, is, is bespoke, and it's really unique to that relationship. Uh, and so while I, I, I'm a big fan of trying to find a way to put some constraints on the growth of the Chinese arsenal and to increase our transparency into it, my sense is that the tools we're going to need for China are just going to be different than the tools we'll need for Russia. Professor Gronig, do you agree with that, that sentiment? Yeah, if I, if I was reading the Q&A correctly, that question came in from our uh, friend and colleague, David Santoro in Hawaii. So hi, hi David. Thanks for- Hey, David. Um, I, I do think this is the, um, uh, the, the biggest challenge facing U.S. defense policy. Now, not just nuclear policy, but defense policy broadly. Uh, how do we deal with Russia and China at the same time? And, uh, you know, we're dealing with the Ukraine crisis now. What if Russia were to do this against a NATO ally? What if at the same time China were to move against Taiwan? Uh, so being able to deter both of these countries alongside our allies, um, I think, is, is the biggest challenge and, and it's going to be difficult. Uh, and um, it's made even more difficult by this Chinese nuclear buildup, because in, in the past, the United States could essentially treat Russia as the major nuclear competitor and China and North Korea and others would be kind of lesser included cases. Now, now with China's nuclear buildup, we're facing two um, kind of peer nuclear powers at the same time. And I think a lot of our deterrence frameworks, a lot of our evidence are about this bipolar relationship. So how do you deal with this trilateral uh, relationship? So this is a huge challenge. I'm, I'm in the early stages of doing some uh, thinking of this uh, on my own. I, I don't think anybody has the answer yet. Um, but I, I do think that, you know, if the, we look at the way the United States has traditionally done its nuclear force sizing, uh, China's buildup will put pressures on that. Because as I said, the way we traditionally do it is count up the targets. Uh, how many warheads do we need to hold at risk those targets? And as China builds hundreds of new silos, that's hundreds of new targets the United States needs to cover. Uh, which will um, uh, put upward pressure on the, the U.S. arsenal. So I do think in this NPR and in uh, the Strategic Posture Commission that Congress uh, has authorized, we, we should look hard at whether um, 1,550 nuclear weapons, that's currently the limit in New START, is, is that still the right number or does the United States need to look at um, uh, increasing uh, the size of its strategic deployed arsenal? So many people have depicted China's nuclear buildup as an aggressive bid for hegemony. Uh, Dr. Lewis, do you think this is a fair assessment or do you think that their uh, buildup is defensive? Um, I don't think it matters is actually the big question. I think at the moment that it's defensive, but over time capabilities change and intentions change and those things can have an effect on 
on one another. I mean, I think back to a conversation I once had in Beijing with two Chinese colleagues, uh, one of whom was very assertive that China would never seek numerical superiority with the United States. And I asked his other colleague about that. And he thought about it for a minute. And he said, you know, it never really occurred to me we might have that someday. And so these things are dynamic. I mean, what I do believe is at the moment, we made a bet during the Bush administration that was continued to, into the Obama administration that if we maintained an arsenal that was much larger than China, they would be dissuaded from trying to catch up. Uh, I think that bet has not paid off. We're now seeing a pretty big buildup and they're pretty committed to being able to defeat our missile defense system and to retain at least a minimal capability to retaliate against us. Uh, I'm prepared to live with that. I don't love it. Uh, but again, I don't think we're going to eliminate nuclear weapons. And it seems to me that trying to spend large amounts of money to stay ahead of them hasn't worked. So at the moment, it looks to me like they're simply building up to preserve their deterrent. Uh, but I do think it is important to keep an eye on it because, you know, it that is absolutely the kind of thing that can change. A follow-up question uh, on the JCPOA. Um, one of our audience members asks, should Biden attempt to revitalize the JCPOA, uh, excuse me, the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action, the, or also known as the Iran deal? And was that deal a good endeavor for U American nuclear policy? Um, was it worth, would it be worth going against the wishes of Israel to engage or re-engage in this agreement with Iran? I think it's a good idea. Um... It's a little hard to know, though, because as somebody who studies a lot of North Korea, uh, we had an agreement with North Korea that fell apart. And the Bush administration tried to put that agreement back together. And I was supportive of diplomacy when the Bush administration did it. And I think it was worth trying to do. But I think we now know in hindsight it was too late that North Korea had already decided at that point that they were going to build a bomb. Where we are with North, where we are with Iran, I think is in a very similar place. Uh, I, th I thought the deal was a good one. Um, it was not good because it was perfect, but it was good because it improved our ability to find covert facilities. Uh, and we have to keep in mind that Iran had built several that had been revealed. Uh, I'm extremely worried that Iran will again try to build a covert facility that they will use to make a nuclear weapon. And I thought the monitoring provisions of that deal gave us our best chance uh, of being able to find it. So uh, I'm someone who thinks that it's good that the administration is trying to get the deal back together. Um, but I'm also someone who thinks that, uh, you know, we have waited long enough and the situation is bad enough um, that it may be too late. But regardless, I set that against the kind of reality of the situation, which is uh, I think it would be very hard to disarm Iran by force if we don't occupy it in the way we did Iraq, which I don't think we want to do. Uh, and when I have asked some of my Israeli friends, what do we do after a bombing run and they reconstitute their program in two or three years, they said, well, it's going to be like mowing the grass. We have to do it periodically. That does not strike me as ultimately a sustainable solution to that problem. Uh, so since I would like to head off a nuclear armed Iran, I'm, I'm willing to give diplomacy uh, one last shot. And Professor Koenig, with the current crisis in Ukraine, I'm curious, what do you think, how do you think the uh, nuclear balance of power is going to affect both country's decisions, the US and Russia, and whether or not to uh, invade or defend Ukraine? Well, the Biden administration has already taken off um, direct US military intervention in the crisis, has taken that off the table. Uh, Biden said early on that um, the United States wouldn't get involved. Uh, I, I think that was a mistake to make that um, comment. Um, uh, you know, uh, even if uh, we had no intention of getting involved, uh, there was no reason to tell Putin that. I think we should leave a little doubt. Uh, in his mind, you know, you don't take your own queen off the, the chessboard in a, in a game of chess. Um, but I do think nuclear weapons are, are already relevant uh, to this crisis. And I think Russian military strategy um, thinks about backstopping conventional aggression with nuclear threats. And, and we saw that very clearly in the 2014 uh, invasion of Ukraine and Crimea, uh, where um, Putin was making a pretty clear nuclear threats at the height of the crisis. He said, we're a major nuclear power. It's best not to mess with us. And so I suspect if, if, if he does further invade Ukraine, uh, that he will rattle the nuclear saber again. And I think the message to the West and, and to the United States will be, you know, don't mess uh, with me, that don't intervene in Ukraine. Do you really want to fight a nuclear war um, over Ukraine? So I do think um, these nu nuclear weapons are relevant to this crisis. Uh, 
Uh, and then if it weren't Ukraine, but it were Estonia or a country that the United States uh, would, would um, get involved for, then I think the nuclear balance becomes much more relevant. Uh, Russia does have this kind of scary escalate uh, to de-escalate uh, possibility in its strategy of using a small number of low yield nuclear weapons early um, in a conflict. And so I think the United States and its allies do need to have similar capabilities, not to match um, warhead for warhead, as I think somebody um, suggested earlier, but at least to have something in this space to where we can credibly counter uh, in kind and, and don't face a, a suicide or surrender uh, problem. Uh, so uh, maybe a, a roundabout way of answering the question, but I do, I do think that nuclear weapons will feature um, even more in this crisis if Russia decides to invade. Thank you, Professor Gronick. Um, we're shifting into our closing remarks now that we're getting close to the end. Um, Professor Gronick, you have two minutes. Okay, well, thank you um, again then uh, for uh, this opportunity. It's been a pleasure. Um, I guess I would just um, finish by saying I, I think debates like this are, are a good one. Uh, no, we, should, we don't want to engage in groupthink. We want to hear the smartest um, arguments uh, of different things from uh, various points of view. Uh, but I think nothing, uh, you know, Jeffrey made some good points, but I think nothing I heard uh, changed uh, my view. I do think that U.S. nuclear weapons are uh, important to global peace and security. Uh, we can afford them, contrary to you know, many of the comments about cost. Uh, in fact, I would say what we can't afford is, is not to have an, an effective deterrent. Um, allowing a major attack on us, our allies, uh, would be uh, fighting a major war with Russia and China. That would be truly um, uh, a cost we couldn't afford. And so uh, maintaining an effective deterrent uh, to prevent that from happening, I think, makes good sense. It, it's what our allies uh, want us to do. 30 uh, democratic uh, countries in, in Europe and Asia are, are watching the nuclear posture review closely. Their security depends on it. And so for an administration, the Biden administration that came to office promising to revitalize U.S. leadership, promising uh, to um, strengthen relationships with allies, uh, I think this is a place where we need to come through from them, uh, for them, uh, make sure we have the forces necessary to defend the free world. So all in my in my comments there. Thank you. Uh, now, Dr. Lewis, you may make your closing statements. Uh, well, I'd like to join Matt in, in thanking you for organizing this. Uh, it's been a tremendous amount of fun. Uh, you know, I, the place I would end it is 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 just by saying that I I don't think the right way to frame this is the used car salesman analogy of 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 telling you you know when you say I can't afford a Porsche, saying well you can't afford not to have a Porsche. The reality is we live in an era of resource constraints, and I'm not talking about just can we spend five or six percent of our defense budget, but it's really this fundamental question. Are, are we going to live with deterrence? Are we going to try to spend so much money that we will build a, a superior force to two peer competitors in Russia and China? And it's not merely about like how much of our defense budget it takes up, but we have to remember the Russians and the Chinese get a vote too. So each dollar we spend, right? That's a, that's a ruble or a renminbi they will spend. And I just think if we step back and we look at it and we look at the totality of our commitments around the world, and we look at just the reality of the technologies that are involved, it is extremely hard to imagine that we're gonna be able to build our way out of mutual deterrence. And if that's the case, then that means we're gonna to have to learn to settle for less, and it makes sense to spend that money on other conventional capabilities. Great, thank you. Uh, with that, we'll wrap this event up. Thank you so much, Professor Kronik and Dr. Lewis for joining us today. And thank you to all of our audience members